I'm, I'm Jan, as you know, and I'm one of the founders of a company called CardioMe. At CardioMe, we use machine learning to solve problems with, with automated analysis of medical images. This is to improve understanding of our hearts, mainly. In the next few minutes, I will show you how we build tools that will make our healthcare at least a little bit more efficient. We'll see how the AI, the artificial intelligence, can solve some of your computer vision problems too. I'll briefly mention how we deploy our machine learning models into production and some techniques that worked pretty well for us. We are always keen to learn how to do stuff better. And then I will happily discuss with you what we can improve and I'll uh, answer questions. So where is the AI now? So we have autonomous cars coming on our roads. Computers are beating us in chess, poker, go. We are getting pretty much better in many domains, but where is modern medicine today? We have been collecting knowledge, medical knowledge for, for centuries. We are now collecting more data than ever. But do we see any, anything really tangible to us? What, what does it mean? Even today, every 18 seconds, one person dies on this planet because of a cardiovascular disease. 45% of us will die of this disease. So that's, that's why I'm, I'm excited about how we can use, apply these machine learning and AI techniques to solve some of the biggest challenges. And that's why CardioMe exists. So over the years, we have become really, really good in imaging, imaging cardiac and other parts of our body. We have different strategies to measure different quantities. These things give us, give us new senses to have a look inside of our body without cutting it, which is really quite practical. But, but you know, understanding these images requires probably a lot of experience from a, from a radiologist, and it takes a lot of time to interpret these images. When we look at these images, what do we see ourselves? I'll, I'll show you now two images from magnetic resonance of two hearts. These hearts are acquired along the short axis of the heart, which is just like if you would cut the heart through the middle. Can you see any differences between these two? I'll give you a hint. The heart on the left is healthy, and the heart on the right is suffering from an ischemic heart failure. You might have learned at school that the heart has four ventricles, four chambers, two ventricles and two atria. Here in these images, we see only two of those chambers, the ventricles, which are, this is the left ventricle, even if it's on the right. So these are the left ventricles, and this is the right one. The left one is responsible for pumping the blood into the, into the oxygenated blood into the body. So if the left one is not working well, then we have a serious problem. You can see here that the ischemic heart failure heart has the left ventricle much, much larger than the healthy one. That's probably due to some pres high pressure overload of the ventricle, so it gets dilated. How, can we quantify these differences somehow? Well, in uh, normal clinical practice, what a doctor does, it takes the images slice by slice and draw contours on the images. When you draw the contours on, on all of the images, which are not only 2D images, but it's actually a stack of 2D images, so it's, you have seven slices, or 10 slices, along the, the long axis. Plus, you have a time, time dimension, so it's a beating heart. So you can now imagine that to quantify these differences, you need a lot of time. So you do it for every size, for every frame, 
And without any good software, it, it is actually not possible to do it practically. But with better software, you can decrease the time to something around 30 minutes to do it manually. But it's still quite a lot. Can we do it with maybe faster with things like the AI? Can you, to do this, we will need to find a good representation of the images for the computer. So let's first see how we see the images. So what a human sees, we see a picture, a photograph of the heart. If we zoom in a little bit, you might start to see the, the pixels of the heart itself. And if we would enlarge the pixels much more, we would get something really, really pixelated. So what does the computer see? The computer sees an array of numbers, one number for each pixel of the image. But I actually lied to you. The computer does not see this. The computer sees this. It's literally just an array of numbers. So how can we get from this array of numbers to something that the computer can use and understand and help us to, to extract, for example, those volumetric measurements that we saw before? One way to do it is something like what I did, for example, during my thesis for segmentation. Well, you can maybe decide, OK, I will cut off the intensities that are higher than some threshold. That will give, him, give me the blood pool, so it's the, the second image on the, on the left. So one, once you get the blood pool, then you realize, OK, maybe well, the aorta is part of the blood pool. The arteries are part of the blood pool. I don't want it there. I want just the ventricles or just the atria. In that case, you might find a way to, to get rid of the aorta. For example, there are mathematical operators that will tell you if structures are tubular, for example. You know, arteries are tubular. It's, there are long tubes. And if you can enhance them or remove them, then you can get something that will tell you what is an, uh, an artery and what is not, and what should remain, and so on and so on. So you devise new ways to measure new quantities, and it's actually quite a pain. Can, can we find some techniques to do this automatically? And, well, there's no silver bullet. There's nothing that will work always for you. But just machine learning, for example, is one way to do this. It, it is a way to code problems with data rather than by explicitly coding them. So we have a machine learning technique toolbox in our belt. How can we use it to understand the images? There are techniques that have been developed well over the past 30 years. The things that are neural networks and convolutional neural networks are pretty old. They're, they date to uh, the early 90s or eight, late 80s. So there is nothing really new. What is new is the computational power we have today and the massive amount of data that we have today as well. So before, it was pretty difficult to make a network. Well, you could do it yourself. But today, it's becoming really, really simple. There are Python libraries that can help you to do that. In just six lines of code, you can, for example, have a object recognition model loaded, images loaded, and then to do a prediction. So this can, for example, make an absolutely fantastic elephant classifier. Do you know how to discriminate Indian from African elephants? Well, if you study the elephants, you probably find out that you can measure the size of their ears, you can measure the shape of their forehead, and their global size. Think about it for a second. How would you code such a thing? It is really, really hard. But this thing can be now done in just six seconds. Can, can we apply these things to other domains? Can we reuse the representations that the network is learning? So as an input, we have a colorful image. We have a, an image that has three channels, the red, green, and blue channel, RGB, so-called. So these channels are then fed into uh, a mathematical operator called convolution. And all it does, without all the details, is that it combines these three channels and creates other new channels that represent something different. Then you take these channels and 
another layer of convolution on top of that, and you learn new representations and new channels. And each of these channels is learning to represent something maybe different. Maybe some channels are good at detecting eyes, some channels are probably good at de detecting faces, and maybe some are good at detecting, for example, a ischemic heart disease. When we have these representations, we can extract them really easily. Again, nothing complicated in the keras, just four lines of Python code. You can extract these features, these channels, from any part of the network, and then use it in your machine learning pipeline to, the, to do something great. So you extract the channels, and then you feed it into, for example, a standard linear regression from scikit-learn. The great thing about this is that you don't need a massive computational power to do it. You first need to extract the features. Yes, it takes a lot of time, and you can probably run it overnight on your, even on your CPU if you don't have a graphical processing unit, the GPU. But once you extract the features, then you can really just load the, the array and uh, train any scikit-learn algorithm on top of this data. We use this, for example, to predict where cardiac landmarks are. We train the network with images, and we, we output the linear regression output, outputs, outputs as coordinates of the landmarks. But maybe you are bored, more adventurous, you, st you are starting to get more feel of the neural nets, and you want to explore your own architectures, you want to explore your own problems, so you, you might want to define your own stuff too. Well, it's not really hard. It's just like Lego pieces. Things fall into each other. If you, if you understand what the convolution is, that it's tra transforming an input image into some other image that might be useful for some task, then it's not really hard. Then there are some other layers that uh, you will understand when you start to dig into this, and you will start to understand why it's used, and uh, that's what I encourage you. Just take the global view first, and then go deep, deeper inside of how it works. You don't need to study the math. You don't need to learn how the acoustics works to play guitar. You just take the guitar and play it. So you can train your network from scratch. You define the... Uh, the computational graph, you also have some input, then you do some convolution on top of the input, then uh, you do some other operation and so on, till you reach some output. And then you just define the model, very simply define in what is input and output. But now, you need to train the model. So this is what all machine learning is about. You have some model, you have some data, and how can you find the right parameters of the model? That means, for example, the right parameters of the convolutional filters. To, to solve the, the problem we want to solve. So why not to just compile the model? That's what you just have to do in Keras to, to have the computational model compiled, and then you fit it to the, to the images, to the data, and the labels. And then you save it, and that's pretty much it. Now you only need to know what are you optimizing. You just learn probably a set of tools, set of, uh, set of loss functions that will help you to solve one or the other problem. So for example, for classification, a categorical entropy might be a good thing. If you want to predict some continuous value, you might look at, for example, mean square error. But what a loss function is, it just measures how good your match of that prediction is to the, to the, to the real data, to the ground truth. When, when the loss function is high, that means your model is really bad. So the, the network will try to change the parameters, wiggle the parameters, so that it goes down. And this is, if you had calculus at school, you would probably know that that's what a uh, gradient of a function is, and it helps you to compute it. But you don't need to know calculus to do it. Uh, Keras uses TensorFlow and Theano as a backend, and these two libraries do the calculus for you. Now you have a trained model, and you want to deploy it to, to production to, some, to be able to serve it to other customers to, or to your friends. Here I will show you just a very simple task, uh, Flask server that, will, that can take your model 
and make it available. Again, it's super simple. We just load the model, make some route, and in the route, convert the input parameters, the input uh, request parameters, into NumPy arrays, then do the prediction on top of these NumPy arrays, which give you, give you the output, NumPy arrays, and you just convert back the NumPy arrays to something usable for the user, and you put it, for example, into a JSON response and send it back. And that is it. So to make it this available, to be sure that it always runs with the same conditions, it's probably a good idea to wrap it into something like a container. So it's, again, nothing really difficult to make a Docker container today. You just define what needs to be copied into the, doc, uh, into the container, and uh, you build it. Just remember, put the model into the container. It will make your life much easier. You can share the whole container, and the whole container will do the whole job of prediction. And you can put it on a Google Cloud, on Amazon Cloud, it does not matter. Your container will do the prediction with the model. So once you have the container defined, you build it, you run it, and you can run curl, for example, to, 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 to send data to the model and to do the predictions. Well, of course, you could use, for example, Kubernetes to do this for you. And I think that's probably a good idea. If your Docker container, for some reason, crashes, Docker, uh, Kubernetes will make sure that uh, uh, the container will come up, come back up. It will scale if needed and so on. But for now, we don't need to worry about scale. So now, once we have this, we can also package the model into, for example, a, a C++ library. And that's what we did, too. It does not change the performance itself, but just for some applications, we might need to do that. And it would be a pain if we would need to, re we'd need to recode the whole machine learning in C++. Well, fortunately, Keras, well, probably TensorFlow is better for that, and a library called MXNet can do that for you. So you train your model, you define the model in Python, you train it in Python, and then you export the model uh, into a C, uh, into a, you export the model, and then you can load it from your C runtime. And you can then build your own applications from that. But we're on a Python library, so let's not talk about C today. And uh, let's see if we can reduce the time for the segmentation itself. These networks are actually show, doing a pretty good job, and uh, they reduce the time from 30 minutes to, to just 12 seconds. And this is on a GPU, though. But think about it, too. This network is, is taking years of experience of radiologists, and it's learning the whole thing, well, not the whole thing, part of that, a very specialized part of that, in one day of training. And it can replicate, almost. And this is how one of those predictions look like. They're not perfect, and some of them will need to touch, touch up a little bit. But this is all about it. Just we need something. At first, we need some iteration, and then we can always collect the feedback, have someone experience correct the feedback, and learn from that again and again and again. And these things will improve. And that's the beauty of it. So. We have some segmentation. We can do segmentation with Keras. It's, you saw, it's not really hard. It's in total six lines of code, if you know the model. And uh, so I, I will probably show you some tips and tricks that we use for training deep nets. One of the things that's really important to us is to iterate really fast. There's really no need for perfection at first. Find a good model that works for you maybe a very basic one. For some cases, deep learning is not necessary. If linear regression works for you, that's fantastic. Go ahead and use it. There is no need to go really fancy with these complicated algorithms. It's also pretty important to be able to compare which model is better than the other. 
And of course, as we, uh, as we train the models, we measure lots of different metrics. For example, for the segmentation, we might measure how close are we to the contours. If there are any, any parts that are scattered around that are not part of the object, and so on. But you just need to decide on one single metric that will help you to judge which model is better than the other. And that can be a combination of, that, of, of them all. It can be a, uh, a weighted average, for example. So this is really good to choose which metric to use, which model to use. Second thing is to progressive confidence. We have seen some talks here about how we can build pipelines. And pipelines are really one of the best things to do in machine learning. Pipelines are really just code. And it is super important to have some code that is repeatable. Then you can run again. And uh, even if you delete your, uh, your your data, your results, if you still have the raw data, you should be able to reproduce what you created. I also believe that the whole thing about pipelines, code, also data should be somehow versioned. And if you do these things together, if you version them together, you can put it into your CI, into your continuous integration server, which builds the models for you as artifacts. And this is very powerful. So you can have lots of Git branches, for example, and each of those branches is one of those experiments. And then you just collect the artifacts, evaluate the, the models, and see which one is the best one. Third, there is really no glory in data preparation. People maybe don't underestimate the value of high quality data, but the context aware data is the best thing you can have for machine learning algorithms. Without that, actually, you cannot do much. So treat your data with respect and uh, clean them nicely and put them all into a standard format. It's, it makes things much easier if you just make one access, one pattern of access to all of your data, even if it comes from different sources. Then, if you just don't have such a large data set, you might want to find a ways to make it bigger. So why not to, for example, augment the data? Augmentation means, for example, I have an image of a cat, and I rotate the image of a cat. But it's still an image of a cat. So the label is the same, but I, I, I have a new image. For the network, it actually looks different if it's rotated. So you can uh, rotate, scale, or you, can, you can find lots of different ways to augment the data. You can also find ways maybe to generate new data. If you have a model, a physical model, how the data was generated, then you can create your new training samples. And this is pretty important, for example, for rare diseases. If you have a rare disease, oh, there, the algorithms will probably not help you very well. But we just cannot make people sick to make samples in the data set. It is not ethical. So maybe we should find ways to generate data, for example, for masks. So maybe some of you have played with things that is called, uh, that's called uh, well, it's served on affinelayer.com. And you can draw, for example, edges of cats, and it generates funny images of cats. But actually, it's pretty impressive how it looks. If you, so this is when you have a small data set. What if you have a maybe larger data set, but not all of your data is annotated? And I think that just just do it. Annotate the data as fast as possible, because the more data is usually much better than a better model. So just go for it. There are works that, help, that will help you to annotate the data faster. You can look into active learning, semi-supervised learning. That will propagate uh, the labels to the, uh, to the closest ones. And uh, you can then reuse that for training, for example. So, and finally, be practical. As I said, there's really no need to go for the, the, the biggest, most powerful algorithms to start. Just start with something simple, get, a, get the understanding, and start to build from that. So I will probably conclude now. In the ancient Greek god Asclepius, the god of healing and medicine, chose snake as his tool. And I, I, for us, Python has been working fantastically well. 
So I, I just strongly invite you to, to try Python. If, if you're doing any machine learning, image processing, AI, just go for that. Python is a very good tool for, for this job. Currently, we are acquiring more data than ever. There are, there's massive computational power coming. We have new things like virtual reality and uh, 3D printing coming. So maybe at some point, we'll be able to print our own spare organs to, to replace the, the ones that do not work. But what, in the meanwhile, let's just say something more practical. We can just make better tools for doctors and patients. So at Cardiomy, we are trying to do exactly that, to make doctors do better decisions and do them more efficiently. And once we have uh, the doctors covered, we of course want to cover all of you. These things should be available to normal people, or normal, to all of us, uh, that we can play with our own data, we can play with our own hearts, or brains, or whatever you have, and get, get understanding of what it, what it really is. And actually understanding it and the knowledge is something that will help us go more forward. Only, only understanding will help us how to make positive changes in our lifestyles and how to, how to improve our health and how to push the whole humanity forward. Well, we'll be releasing this as an API in, a, in some time in the, in the near future. And we are pretty excited to see what you build on top of that. I just can't wait. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, we, uh, for your talk. We don't hear very much about medicine in, at the PyCon conferences, so it was very interesting. And uh, we've uh, received plenty of questions, so let's move to them. How much training data is needed or used for the cardio models? Uh, it depends what you want to do. Uh, if you are, for example, training of models for the for the ventricles which are the simpler thing if you use some smart data augmentation for example you can do decent predictions with hundreds of images hundreds means uh, hundreds of 3d images so those have uh, several slices uh, if you want to do something more complex if you would for example want to recognize if a heart is ischemic or if it's a congenital heart disease that means that the the patient, the, 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 the human was born with a defect of the heart. In that case, maybe you, you need a lot more because the variability of the data set will be much, much larger. But uh, if you want to do just the, the model and just a simple cavity, then probably you will be fine with uh, some hundreds of models and good augmentation. What other areas in medicine do you think is suitable to apply machine learning in terms of diagnostic images, classification, recognition? Probably ask which areas it would not apply. Because it, uh, analyzing images is, is something that you, you are really trained, you're trained for years, and you can miss things very easily. Imagine that you are going through, uh, through a volume of 500 slices, and it is very hard uh, not to miss uh, something small, for example, a small lesion or a small tumor. So in that case, it's the machine will actually never gets tired. The, it can work consistently. I'm not saying it's better than human, and I actually believe that humans plus AI is better than, than AI alone. And uh, that's what we should push for. And, uh, but I don't think there's an area where uh, these techniques would not work, except for those where we don't have much data. So for the rare diseases, we probably want to revert to something like the, those expert systems that we have heard or something similar. Uh, can you share information about uh, the model's accuracy and recall? Do you have special weighting for false negatives? That's a very good question that uh, accuracy itself is actually a very bad measure of, is a very bad metric for segmentation because you can just imagine that most of the voxels that you want to segment are the background. And if I would assign 
uh, a label, uh, as, uh, to every voxel a label, like a background, we would get a very accurate model. And this is not what we want, so, but anyway, the accuracy, I don't, I don't have the numbers, it's around 90, 90% average. Uh, next question. I, I think you, you had uh, replied uh, in one of the previous, but uh, are your methods uh, uh, applicable on the CT images of uh, human brain? Absolutely. The, we apply the methods here for, the, for cardiac MRI and for C, uh, cardiac CT, and they work pretty well. And uh, there's no reason why it should not work for a human brain, but it depends what you want to get out of the images. A uh, human brain is uh, a soft tissue, and CT itself is is passing uh, ionizing radiation through the through the brain, and the soft tissue does not absorb the radiation real well, which means that you have pretty low contrast between between the different tissues of the brain. So I would actually recommend to use MR for brains, unless there is something like you want to measure the arteries of the brain and some aneurysms and stuff like that. I is it difficult to test and iterate your models in production? Do you re require FDA approvals or any other approvals? Uh, yes, we will require an FDA approval. That's why we cannot share it with, with you all. Uh, how many training examples uh, did you have for segmentation problem? Uh, what GPU did you use f uh, to train the network? So we, we had, uh, for this thing, we had around 120 examples. Uh, that means 120 uh, 3D images. Each of those had uh, was around 200 times 200 times 180 um, space. And uh, which GPU did, did we use? We we used the the GTX uh, 980 Ti, which has six gigabytes of memory and I don't know how many CUDA cores. Uh, what is the uh, CardioMe's business model? Uh, so right now we are having a, oh, we can discuss that in private. But uh, of course, I, I believe, I'm a strong believer in, uh, in pricing per, per, per unit. So actually to get just a share, a fair share of uh, of what the whole thing costs, and to have it uh, to have this thing really simple to compute uh, to compute and to to have the healthcare more accountable, to see what costs what and where the data uh, where the money is lost because uh, the the healthcare itself is a big well, ready for money to be thrown in. Uh, is Keras enough, or you also build models in pure TensorFlow in CardioMe? We do have some TensorFlow, but Keras to start and to do even very difficult things is enough. Uh, and for those of you who maybe have watched the last uh, TensorFlow conference at Google, uh, Keras itself is becoming part of TensorFlow. And it will be very easy, actually it's already pretty easy, to combine, mix and match Keras and TensorFlow. So you can build your model in a very easy way in Keras and then uh, continue building the model in TensorFlow and do it as you like. Uh, which l learning algorithm are you using? Uh, so f I assume this means which optimization algorithm we're using for the deep net. And uh, most of the time, we are using a uh, either ADEM or uh, RMS prop. And this is actually a very good question. It's, it's, it's good to has no answer that works all the time, and that's why you, you should have metrics and to try different stuff. And sometimes these give you intuition why they work, and uh, you can uh, you can have a look uh, on the math of of Adam when it works better. And so, yeah, just 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 try which one works and don't give up. Next question is also regarding the, the business, probably. How do you see the future of Cardiomi? I see the future as uh, something that is really helping all of us to answer the basic questions and the, the more difficult questions about our health. Uh, not only is really the segmentation is, is, is something that is necessary because we need to extract the models, 
these models are then used for simulations of, of and planning of operations, for example. But the, the vision is uh, to have something that you can also like call from home if you if you are if you are worried about your your heartbeat. You many of you have smart watches which measure the activity, and you can probably there there are ways to to at least calm you down a little bit, tell you that it's okay. But I don't want cardiomy to be something that will rule our lives. Really, we should not do technology just for the sake of technology. We should be doing technology to solve really important challenges and to, to really push our understanding where we can go for. But I, I don't want something that is omnipresent, that will always monitor you, that will always have a look at you. But yes, I want something that will make some, for example, dashboard where you can go and see how your body works. Okay. Uh, who did you uh, get the dat uh, data from? Uh, how did you persuade them? Uh, what about the labels? Uh, I've been lucky enough to uh, and have worked with uh, fantastic people in the past, and uh, I think that that helps to to have some good agreements with them to deal with things together. And uh, the labels were done by radiologists and. They also see that it's a waste of time to to do all the segmentations themselves. It's just if you can save 30 minutes of their lives, that's something very valuable. Uh, why did you decide to use uh, neural networks uh, instead of, uh, say, AAM? AAM. <laughs> oh, okay, so active appearance model AAM. Uh, why? It's a very <laughs> an excellent question. That was. Uh, part of the discussion I've had at my defense a long time ago. And AAM is, or these shape models are, are great if you, have, if you don't have enough data and if your data set looks uh, almost alike. So it can work really well for hearts, for normal hearts, where you have the ventricles, which are almost always the same, and uh, then you apply a statistical model like the AAM, and you get a nice, smooth, regularized segmentation, for example. But why, why not? There are cases when these shape models do not represent the data that you want. For example, as uh, I mentioned before, the congenital, congenital diseases are, uh, there are congenital diseases where you have, for example, one ventricle missing. It's called a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And when you have this heart, left heart missing, then you just cannot fit an active shape model on top of this data. But what you can do, if you have something like uh, convolutional nets, is you can transfer at least part of the knowledge to your model, and the model can learn from both uh, these types of diseases and the normal hearts, and it can find something common and representations that help you to, to do both things at the same time. Oh, and the last question is, what metric did you use to evaluate your model? So it's a combination of, uh, of computational time, of uh, distance to contour, of a uh, number of those blobs that are separated from the, from the main part, and some other things, but I don't remember at the moment.